Section 11 of Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 1, 1835 to 1842, by Hans Christian Andersen, translated by H. P. Paul. The Galoshes of Fortune, Part 1, by Hans Christian Andersen, 1838. A Beginning In a house in Copenhagen, not far from the King's New Market, a very large party had assembled, the host and his family expecting no doubt to receive invitations in return. One half of the company were already seated at the card tables, the other half seemed to be waiting the result of their hostess's question. Well, how shall we amuse ourselves? Conversation followed, which after a while began to prove very entertaining. Among other subjects it turned upon the events of the Middle Ages, which some persons maintained were more full of interest than our own times. Counselor Knapp defended this opinion so warmly that the lady of the house immediately went over to his side, and both exclaimed against Orsted's essays on ancient and modern times, in which the preference is given to our own. The counselor considered the times of the Danish king, Hans, as the noblest and happiest. He died in 1513. He married Christine, daughter of the electoral Prince Ernest of Saxony. The conversation on this topic was only interrupted for a moment by the arrival of a newspaper, which did not, however, contain much worth reading, and while it was still going on, we will pay a visit to the ante-room in which cloaks, sticks, and goloshes were carefully placed. Here sat two maidens, one young and the other old, as if they had come and were waiting to accompany their mistress home. But on looking at them more closely, it could easily be seen that they were no common servants. Their shapes were too graceful, their complexions too delicate, and the cut of their dresses much too elegant. They were two fairies. The younger was not Fortune herself, but the chambermaid of one of Fortune's attendants, who carries about her more trifling gifts. The elder one, who was named Care, looked rather gloomy. She always goes about to perform her own business in person for then she knows it is properly done. They were telling each other where they had been during the day. The messenger of fortune had only transacted a few unimportant matters. For instance, she had preserved a new bonnet from a shower of rain, and obtained for an honest man a bow from a titled nobody, and so on. But she had something extraordinary to relate, after all. I must tell you, said she, that today is my birthday and in honor of it I have been entrusted with a pair of goloshes to introduce amongst mankind. These goloshes have the property of making every one who puts them on imagine himself in any place he wishes or that he exists at any period. Every wish is fulfilled at the moment it is expressed, so that for once mankind have the chance of being happy. No, replied Care, you may depend upon it that whoever puts on those galoshes will be very unhappy, and bless the moment in which he can get rid of them. What are you thinking of? replied the other. Now see, I will place them by the door. Some one will take them instead of his own, and he will be the happy man. This was the end of their conversation. What happened to the counsellor? It was late. When Councillor Knapp, lost in thought about the times of King Hans, desired to return home, and fate so ordered it that he put on the goloshes of fortune instead of his own, and walked out into the east street. Through the magic power of the goloshes, he was at once carried back three hundred years to the time of King Hans, for which he had been longing when he put them on. Therefore he immediately set his foot into the mud and mire of the street, which in those days possessed no pavement. Why, this is horrible! How dreadfully dirty it is, said the counsellor. 
and the whole pavement has vanished, and the lamps are all out. The moon had not yet risen high enough to penetrate the thick, foggy air, and all the objects around him were confused together in the darkness. At the nearest corner a lamp hung before a picture of the Madonna, but the light it gave was almost useless, for he only perceived it when he came quite close, and his eyes fell on the painted figures of the mother and child. That is most likely a museum of art, thought he, and they have forgotten to take down the sign. Two men, in the dress of olden times, passed by him. What odd figures, thought he, they must be returning from some masquerade. Suddenly he heard the sound of a drum and fifes, and then a blazing light from torches shone upon him. The counsellor stared with astonishment as he beheld a most strange procession pass before him. First came a whole troop of drummers, beating their drums very cleverly. They were followed by lifeguards with long bows and crossbows. The principal person in the procession was a clerical-looking gentleman, and the astonished counsellor asked what it all meant, and who the gentleman might be. Why, that is the Bishop of Zealand. Good gracious, he exclaimed, what in the world has happened to the bishop? What can he be thinking about? Then he shook his head and said, it cannot possibly be the bishop himself. While musing on this strange affair, and without looking to the right or left, he walked on through East Street and over High Bridge Place. The bridge, which he supposed led to Palace Square, was nowhere to be found, but instead he saw a bank and some shallow water, and two people who sat in a boat. Does the gentleman wish to be ferried over the holm? asked one. To the holm? exclaimed the counsellor not knowing in what age he was now existing. I want to go to Christian's Haven in Little Turf Street. The men stared at him. Pray tell me where the bridge is, said he. It's a shameful thing that the lamps are not lighted here, and it is as muddy as if one were walking in a marsh. But the more he talked with the boatmen, the less they could understand each other. I don't understand your outlandish talk, he cried at last, angrily turning his back upon them. He could not, however, find the bridge, nor any railings. What a scandalous condition this place is in, said he. Never, certainly, had he found his own times so miserable as on this evening. I think it will be better for me to take a coach. But where are they? There was not one to be seen. I shall be obliged to go back to the King's New Market, said he, where there are plenty of carriages standing, or I shall never reach Christian's Haven. Then he went towards East Street and had nearly passed through it, when the moon burst forth from a cloud. Dear me, what have they been erecting here, he cried, as he caught sight of Eastgate, which in olden times used to stand at the end of East Street. However, he found an opening through which he passed, and came out upon where he expected to find the new market. Nothing was to be seen but an open meadow, surrounded by a few bushes, through which ran a broad canal or stream. A few miserable-looking wooden booths, for the accommodation of Dutch watermen, stood on the opposite shore. Either I behold a Fata Morgana, or I must be tipsy, groaned the counsellor. What can it be? What is the matter with me? He turned back in the full conviction that he must be ill. In walking through the street this time, he examined the houses more closely. He found that most of them were built of lath and plaster and many had only a thatched roof. I am certainly all wrong, said he with a sigh, and yet I only drank one glass of punch. But I cannot bear even that, and it was very foolish to give us punch and hot salmon. I shall speak about it to our hostess, the agent's lady. Suppose I were to go back now and say how ill I feel. I fear it would look so ridiculous, and it is not very likely that I should find any one up. And then he looked for the house but it was not in existence. Now this is really frightful. I cannot even recognize East Street. Not a shop to be seen, nothing but old wretched tumble-down houses, just as if I were at Roxkilde or Ringstead. Oh, I really must be ill. It is no use to stand upon ceremony, but where in the world is the agent's house? There is a house, but it is not his, and people still up in it. I can hear. Oh, dear, I certainly am very queer. As he reached the half-open door, he saw a light and went in. It was a tavern of the olden times, and seemed a kind of beer shop. 
The room had the appearance of a Dutch interior. A number of people, consisting of seamen, Copenhagen citizens, and a few scholars, sat in deep conversation over their mugs, and took very little notice of the newcomer. "'Pardon me,' said the counsellor, addressing the landlady. I, "'I do not feel quite well, and I should be much obliged if you will send for a fly to take me to Christian's Haven." The woman stared at him, and shook her head, and then she spoke to him in German. The counsellor supposed from this that she did not understand Danish. He therefore repeated his request in German. This, as well as his singular dress, convinced the woman that he was a foreigner. She soon understood, however, that he did not find himself quite well, and therefore brought him a mug of water. It had something of the taste of sea-water, certainly, although it had been drawn from the well outside. And then the counsellor leaned his head on his hand, drew a deep breath, and pondered over all the strange things that had happened to him. Is that today's number of the day, which was an evening paper in Copenhagen? He asked quite mechanically, as he saw the woman putting by a large piece of paper. She did not understand what he meant, but she handed him the sheet. It was a woodcut representing a meteor, which had appeared in the town of Cologne. That is very old, said the counsellor, becoming quite cheerful at the sight of this antique drawing. Where did you get this singular sheet? It is very interesting, although the whole affair is a fable. Meteors are easily explained in these days. They are northern lights, which are often seen, and are no doubt caused by electricity. Those who sat near him and heard what he said looked at him in great astonishment, and one of them rose, took off his hat respectfully, and said in a very serious manner, You must certainly be a very learned man, monsieur. Oh, no, replied the counsellor, I can only discourse on topics which every one should understand. Modestia is a beautiful virtue, said the man. Moreover, I must add to your speech, Mihi secus veditur, yet in this case I would suspend my judicium. May I ask to whom I have the pleasure of speaking? I am a bachelor of divinity, said the man. This answer satisfied the counsellor. The title agreed with the dress. This is surely, thought he, an old village schoolmaster, a perfect original, such as one meets with sometimes even in Jutland. This is not certainly a locus docendi, began the man. Still I must beg you to continue the conversation. You must be well read in ancient lore. Oh, yes, replied the counsellor. I am very fond of reading useful old books and modern ones as well, with the exception of everyday stories of which we really have more than enough. Everyday stories? asked the bachelor. Yes, I mean the new novels that we have at the present day. Oh, replied the man with a smile, and yet they are very witty, and are much read at court. The king likes especially the romance of Messrs. Ephan and Gordian, which describes King Arthur and his knights of the round table. He has joked about it with the gentlemen of his court. Well, I have certainly not read that, replied the counsellor. I suppose it is quite new and published by Heiberg. No, answered the man, it is not by Heiberg. Godfred von Gehmen brought it out. Oh, is he the publisher? That is a very old name, said the counsellor. Was it not the name of the first publisher in Denmark? Yes, and he is our first printer and publisher now, replied the scholar. So far all had passed off very well, but now one of the citizens began to speak of a terrible pestilence which had been raging a few years before, meaning the plague of 1484. The counsellor thought he referred to the war in 1490, and was spoken of as quite recent. The English pirates had taken some ships in the Channel in 1801, and the counsellor, supposing they referred to these, agreed with them in finding fault with the English. The rest of the talk, however, was not so agreeable. Every moment one contradicted the other. The good bachelor appeared very ignorant, for the simplest remark of the counsellor seemed to him either too bold or too fantastic. They stared at each other, and when it became worse, the bachelor spoke in Latin in the hope of being better understood, but it was all useless. "'How are you now?' asked the landlady, pulling the counsellor's sleeve. Then his recollection returned to him. In the course of conversation he had forgotten all that had happened previously. 
goodness me where am i said he it bewildered him as he thought of it we will have some claret or mead or bremen beer said one of the guests will you drink with us two maids came in one of them had a cap on her head of two colors in the time of king hans chambermaids were obliged to wear caps of two colors they poured out the wine bowed their heads and withdrew the counselor felt a cold shiver run all over him what is this what does it mean said he but he was obliged to drink with them for they overpowered the good man with their politeness he became at last desperate and when one of them said he was tipsy he did not doubt the man's word in the least only begged them to get a droshky and then they thought he was speaking the muscovite language never before had he been in such rough and vulgar company one might believe that the country was going back to heathenism he observed this is the most terrible moment of my life just then it came into his mind that he would stoop under the table and so creep to the door he tried it but before he reached the entry the rest discovered what he was about and seized him by the feet when luckily for him off came the goloshes and with them vanished the whole enchantment the counsellor now saw quite plainly a lamp and a large building behind it everything looked familiar and beautiful he was in east street as it now appears he lay with his legs turned towards a porch and just by him sat the watchman asleep is it possible that i've been lying here in the street dreaming said he yes this is east street how beautifully bright and gay it looks it is quite shocking that one glass of punch should have upset me like this two minutes afterwards he sat in a droshky which was to drive him to christian's haven he thought of all the terror and anxiety which he had undergone and he felt thankful from his heart for the reality and comfort of modern times which for all their errors were far better than those in which he so lately found himself the watchman's adventures well i declare there lies a pair of galoshes said the watchman no doubt they belong to the lieutenant who lives upstairs they are lying just by his door gladly would the honest man have rung and given them in for a light was still burning but he did not wish to disturb the other people in the house so he let them lie these things must keep the feet very warm said he they are of such nice soft leather and then he tried them on and they fitted his feet exactly now said he how droll things are in this world there's that man can lie down in his warm bed but he does not do so there he goes pacing up and down the room he ought to be a happy man he has neither wife nor children and he goes out into company every evening oh i wish i were he then i should be a happy man as he uttered this wish the goloshes which he had put on took effect and the watchman at once became the lieutenant and there he stood in his room holding a little piece of pink paper between his fingers on which was a poem a poem written by the lieutenant himself who has not had for once in his life a moment of poetic inspiration and at such a moment if the thoughts are written down they flow in poetry the following verses were written on the pink paper oh were i rich oh were i rich how oft in youth's bright hour when youthful pleasures banish every care i longed for riches but to gain a power the sword and plume and uniform to wear the riches and the honor came for me yet still my greatest wealth was poverty ah help and pity me once in my youthful hours when gay and free a maiden loved me and her gentle kiss rich in its tender love and purity taught me alas too much of earthly bliss dear child she only thought of youthful glee she loved no wealth but fairy tales and me thou knowest ah pity me oh were i rich again is all my prayer that child is now a woman fair and free as good and beautiful as angels are oh were i rich in lovers poetry to tell my fairy tale love's richest lore but no i must be silent 
I am poor. Ah, wilt thou pity me? Oh, were I rich in truth and peace below, I need not then my poverty bewail. To thee I dedicate these lines of woe. Wilt thou not understand the mournful tale, a leaf on which my sorrows I relate? Dark story of a darker night of fate. Ah, bless and pity me. Well, yes, people write poems when they're in love, but a wise man will not print them. A lieutenant in love and poor, this is a triangle, or more properly speaking, the half of the broken die of fortune. The lieutenant felt this very keenly, and therefore leaned his head against the window frame and sighed deeply. The poor watchman in the street, said he, is far happier than I am. He knows not what I call poverty. He has a home, a wife and children, who weep at his sorrow and rejoice at his joy. Oh, how much happier I should be if I could change my being and position with him, and pass through life with his humble expectations and hopes. Yes, he is indeed happier than I am. At this moment the watchman again became a watchman, for having through the galoshes of fortune passed into the existence of the lieutenant and found himself less contented than he expected, he had preferred his former condition, and wished himself again a watchman. That was an ugly dream, said he, but droll enough. It seemed to me as if I were the lieutenant up yonder, but there was no happiness for me. I missed my wife and the little ones, who are always ready to smother me with kisses. He sat down again and nodded, but he could not get the dream out of his thoughts, and he still had the galoshes on his feet. A falling star gleamed across the sky. There goes one, cried he. However, there are quite enough left. I should very much like to examine those a little nearer, especially the moon, for that could not slip away under one's hands. The student for whom my wife washes says that when we die we shall fly from one star to another. If that were true, it would be very delightful. But I don't believe it. I wish I could make a little spring up there now. I would willingly let my body lie here on the steps. There are certain things in the world which should be uttered very cautiously, doubly so when the speaker has on his feet the galoshes of fortune. Now we shall hear what happened to the watchman. Nearly everyone is acquainted with the great power of steam. We have proved it by the rapidity with which we can travel, both on a railroad or in a steamship across the sea. But this speed is like the movements of the sloth, or the crawling march of the snail, when compared to the swiftness with which light travels. Light flies nineteen million times faster than the fleetest racehorse, and electricity is more rapid still. Death is an electric shock which we receive in our hearts, and on the wings of electricity the liberated soul flies away swiftly. The light from the sun travels to our earth ninety-five millions of miles in eight minutes and a few seconds. But on the wings of electricity the mind requires only a second to accomplish the same distance. The space between the heavenly bodies is, to thought, no farther than the distance we may have to walk from one's friend's house to another in the same town, and yet this electric shock obliges us to use our bodies here below, unless, like the watchman, we have on the galoshes of fortune. In a very few seconds the watchman had travelled more than two hundred thousand miles to the moon, which is formed of a lighter material than our earth, and may be said to be as soft as new-fallen snow. He found himself on one of the circular ranges of mountains which we see represented in Dr. Madler's large map of the moon. The interior had the appearance of a large hollow bowl-shaped, with a depth about half a mile from the brim. Within this hollow stood a large town. We may form some idea of its appearance by pouring the white of an egg into a glass of water. The materials of which it was built seemed just as soft and pictured forth cloudy turrets and sail-like terraces quite transparent and floating in the thin air. Our earth 
hung over his head like a great dark red ball. Presently he discovered a number of beings which might certainly be called men, but were very different to ourselves. A more fantastical imagination than Herschel's must have discovered these. Had they been placed in groups and painted, it might have been said, what beautiful foliage. They had also a language of their own. No one could have expected the soul of the watchman to understand it, and yet he did understand it, for our souls have much greater capabilities than we are inclined to believe. Do we not, in our dreams, show a wonderful dramatic talent? Each of our acquaintances appear to us then in his own character, and with his own voice. No man could thus imitate them in his waking hours. How clearly, too, we are reminded of persons whom we have not seen for many years. They start up suddenly to the mind's eye with all their peculiarities as living realities. In fact, this memory of the soul is a fearful thing. Every sin, every sinful thought it can bring back. And we may well ask how we are to give account of every idle word that may have been whispered in the heart or uttered with the lips. The spirit of the watchman therefore understood very well the language of the inhabitants of the moon. They were disputing about our earth, and doubted whether it could be inhabited. The atmosphere, they asserted, must be too dense for any inhabitants of the moon to exist there. They maintained that the moon alone was inhabited, and was really the heavenly body in which the old world people lived. They likewise talked politics. But now we will descend to East Street, and see what happened to the watchman's body. He sat lifeless on the steps. His staff had fallen out of his hand, and his eyes stared at the moon about which his honest soul was wandering. "'What is it, o'clock, watchman?' inquired a passenger. But there was no answer from the watchman. The man then pulled his nose gently, which caused him to lose his balance. The body fell forward and lay at full length on the ground as one dead. All his comrades were very much frightened, for he seemed quite dead. Still they allowed him to remain after they had given notice of what had happened. And at dawn the body was carried to the hospital. We might imagine it to be no jesting matter if the soul of the man should chance to return to him, for most probably it would seek for the body in East Street without being able to find it. We might fancy the soul inquiring of the police, or at the address office, or among the missing parcels, and then at length finding it at the hospital. But we may comfort ourselves by the certainty that the soul, when acting upon its own impulses, is wiser than we are. It is the body that makes it stupid. As we have said, the watchman's body had been taken to the hospital, and here it was placed in a room to be washed. Naturally, the first thing done here was to take off the galoshes upon which the soul was instantly obliged to return, and it took the direct road to the body at once. And in a few seconds the man's life returned to him. He declared, when he quite recovered himself, that this had been the most dreadful night he had ever passed. Not for a hundred pounds would he go through such feelings again. However, it was all over now. The same day he was allowed to leave, but the galoshes remained at the hospital. End of The Watchman's Adventures